as I promised you last week, and we're going to hope that my camera stays, stays with us today. Let me lighten me up a little bit. Let's see. That's a little better. Merry Christmas, everybody. Happy holidays. Whatever you celebrate, I wish you all a wonderful time. This is Christmas Eve, and I'm surprised to have 24 people already here with us. Um, we were considering doing it yesterday, but we were still visiting my wife's aunt yesterday. We got home about 3.45 in the afternoon, <clears throat> but it was a wonderful time. We went to a couple of historical um, homes, basically mansions, overlooking the Rappahannock River down in uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia. Wow, what a view. I uh, would love to be there a little bit longer with a good camera and uh, spend some time photographing. But all in all, yeah, we ate well. We had a wonderful time. So my little baby cousins, and uh, again, it was awesome, awesome. But I'm glad to be back today, and we're going to be talking several subjects. Let me go ahead and remove this so I can look at my list. And I just glancing through my Facebook page at this very moment, just before we started uh, going live here, I noticed uh, a couple of posts <clears throat> from someone, actually two people, and uh, one had to do with something really weird. This is, this, I have never seen this, um, and it could be just something off the wall odd or a total failure. Um, Pro 100, that's not laying down any ink whatsoever. And according, apparently, I didn't really get down to ask because I didn't have time. <clears throat> but apparently, he has ink. It's just not flowing ink. And that reminded me of a 3800 that I, did I throw that away or is it still on my floor somewhere? It might be on the floor somewhere. <laughs> and that printer was working fine. I'm telling you, no problems. It was actually sitting on a current table that I have here that has wheels on it. I can move it around. And I simply did this. I moved it from one location to the other. Not even four feet of travel. Boom. Stop laying down ink. No more ink. And I even changed the motherboard, thinking it might have been a, a total failure of the motherboard. In other words, not communicating with the printhead, not telling it, hey, actuate all your little nozzles, buddy, because I'm sending you an image. No, nothing. Absolutely nothing. So in the case of the Pro 100, very simple, two answers. You either have zero ink, which is very unlikely, or an electronic failure with the printhead is simply not communicating whatsoever. But if it was not communicating whatsoever, It'd be throwing you that. It'd be welcoming you for Christmas with that B200 error. Okay, that simple as that. It, it would just simply say, by that error, the blinking, the nine, I think it's nine cycles of blinking lights that I am having trouble communicating with your printer. Therefore, I have received nothing, no command to print. The mechanics of it work. It will, it will move back and forth. You know, the paper will feed as if it was being printed upon, but absolutely no ink is being laid down because those nozzles are not receiving the input, the signals to actuate and, and, and squirt out a little droplet of water, of water, no, of ink. And so if it doesn't receive that, it cannot print. Simple as that. It's sad. Now, that can be dangerous because you really don't know whether it is the motherboard or the logic board, as they call it, or the printhead itself. If it is the printhead itself, in other words, this back plate. The reason I'm jumping into this is because I just saw this and I didn't have a chance to really uh, get back to the man uh, with this problem. This, this plate right here needs to communicate with the carriage equivalent, the contacts on the carriage. And remember, when we talked about Contact cleaner, not alcohol, not anything cheap. Not Don't use Brasso. That's used to polish brass, not this. You're going to have to have a contact cleaner. It'll run you from 
you know, fifteen to thirty-five dollars for a little bottle. You're going to put some on a on a little swab and just clean that area. It will remove all the oxidation. It will remove any kind of any kind of crud that's preventing a good contact to receive the signals from occurring. And so once you clean it, and this is something you should, you maybe should do every six months on your Pro 100. Just take the cartridges out, take the printed out, clean those contacts, use a Q-tip, clean the contacts for the chip readers on your carriage as well. And of course, also the chips themselves. It's a good preventive measure. It's not going to ever totally prevent a failure. Remember, Canon printheads will wear out and eventually they fail. All right, so let's go ahead. On a happier note, let's go ahead and talk with some of our visitors here. We have 35, so I would love it if you could join us. This is, is this the next to the last live stream of the year? Let me make, let me check my calendar here. Yeah, so we have one actually on New Year's Eve. Awesome. That's going to be fun. I'm not going anywhere. We don't drink or do any crazy partying, so I'll be here with you guys. If you do party, then maybe we'll get half the people here. But one way or another, we're going to be here taking care of everyone before the end of 2023. So what was I going to talk about? Oh, geez. Let me see. Yeah, join us on the chat. Tell us who you are. As always, it's the same routine. What printer you're using or are interested in learning to use or own and where you're watching from. We love to see the geographics of our viewers. And uh, the first four or five that we're just patiently waiting are all from Europe. So you guys are always here. You know, no fail, no fail. You're always here. This is backwards. There you go. Okay. Left is right and right is left. That's why I get confused. But anyway, um, yeah, join us. Tell us who you are. If you have any questions at this very moment, go ahead and ask them. And then I'm going to go ahead one by one and greet everyone who has joined the chat. All right, I am drinking a protein drink because I really didn't want to eat a heavy lunch today. Um, we're going to go to our Greek uh, son-in-law, married to my second daughter. He's got a big old lamb dinner prepared for us. We're going to take uh, Jeremy with us, my youngest boy, and uh, that's going to be a slightly, slightly heavy meal. So I wanted to keep things light for the time. And so I'll be wetting my throat with this as we go. <clears throat> so let's start off with Nigel Waters, and he is from Wales, UK. Canon Pro 300 with all the trimmings. Welcome, my friend. Martin Van Gogh is here from Netherlands. Usual stuff. Merry Christmas and happy printing 2024. Let's see what 2024 brings us. I have no idea what's going to be in the horizon as far as printers go. I know what I'm going to have to be doing. I got a, I got a, 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 a issue with my rear central part of the roof. I just noticed some water leaking through the, um, the ceiling the other day. We had a big storm. So I'm going to contact a uh, um, roof person to come over and check that out and see how much that's going to cost. <laughs> anyway, Photo Nikon is here, 780 Edmonton, Canada, Epson Canon printer and various photo editing software. Merry Christmas to all. Thank you very much, my friend. Emmanuel from Normandy, France, and P300 Ink Owl Q Image 1. And so on. Merry Christmas again, he says. Charlie Miller from Toronto, XP15000, saving dollars and dollars and dollars with PC inks, shooting with a vintage Nikon camera and glass. Peace and grace to all. Thank you. The Hang Thing, Gautam from Michigan, graphic design and canvas printing with mostly Canon equipment. Hmm. I like, I like to see people that are actually producing something that maybe they're selling. That would be, that would be, uh, I would love to have people like that as a guest and just share with the audience what is it that you are doing with your printers. I don't do anything with my printers. All I do is test. I print photos to give away. 
I really don't produce anything per se. So I would like to, I would love to have people that are using their printers in a productive way, producing something that they possibly sell either online or locally. So, you know, don't hesitate to ask if you want to come on one of these weekends. Let's see, I got, oh, sorry. How could I miss someone from Milwaukee? El Stone, Stone B, Stone, is that Stone or Stone, Stone Ned Ricker, Ricker Z from Milwaukee. That's where my wife was born. And it's, it's your family. Merry Christmas, love, and wait a minute. Is, is that someone I know? Are you someone I know? Yeah, it is my family. <laughs> I miss you too. Harold Davies. Harold, did you like the uh, did you like the uh, slideshow? I had to put it together quickly yesterday because I realized, oh, geez, I promised I would have that done by today. So I had to search through my, I have a folder full of music that is non-copyrighted because they will flag me immediately. And this whole live stream would be flagged and it wouldn't earn a penny. So I had to look through some of my um, on on copyrighted music uh, so that I would not get flagged. And I used that as the background. I hope you enjoyed it. I don't know whether I was actually include every single one of your photos, but anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. It was it's just beautiful. He's got a twenty one hundred. He's got a P a Pro Ten. Um, love the intro. I still think you're Puerto Rico. My home is amazing. Yeah. That that video I did because I also did a similar one with actual music, you know, like uh, salsa music that is copyrighted. And I just used it on a DVD privately for my home. Um, but as you can see, Puerto Rico has been known to have like three, three, um, maybe more than three um, Miss Universes. And they, of course, New York. Uh, has a huge Puerto Rican community. Uh, areas in Massachusetts now as well, as well as Dominican. And um, so I decided to include a little bit of everything, including the historic parts of old San Juan, the capital of the island. And so I hope you guys enjoyed that video. I, I love making it. Um, and of course, it always hits me here, if you get what I mean. Cass Corner. Hey, what are those? Oh, those are... Are those cat paws? I'm a kitty man. I, I my my aunt has the most wonderful cat that looks like my wild cat upstairs. Uh, that just she doesn't come in the house, but I I built her a house up front and I bought her a new house because it was getting a little bit old. And she just hangs around the front. I make sure that she's always fed. She kind of guards the place. No more mice anywhere. They're all gone. Harold Goldberg from Sunny Richmond Pro 100 with all the trimmings. Wonderful. Just me. Hi, all from Transylvania. Uh, Canon Pro 1000 Epson L8180. That's a tank type printer, I assume. Uh, OEM Inc., QMH Ultimate, and I think I1 Studio, etc. All right. Niels. J care I can't pronounce that is Danish. Danish I cannot do it. Sorry, um, but again, thank you for being here. Hi all, Merry Christmas. Denmark Epson eighty five fifty Canon one thousand Image Ultimate. By the way, I just updated my firmware on the Pro one thousand. It's fine. Just me. Merry Christmas to all. Lawrence Michaels. From the Netherlands, just bought a Pro 1000. Awesome. I remember your your face from uh, Facebook. I believe you're a member of my group. Thanks for coming by. Cat says, Hey, Cat from Cali. I think I killed my, a my, oh, 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 my XP 15,000. It will not turn on after ink leaked into the system. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you got a short circuit. Oh, man. Mm. Not much I can tell you what to do because um, it's not like water. 
and water can evaporate and dry. Ink, ink will evaporate and, and, and continue to short all of those electronics. Um, ah, you may have to purchase a new one. I hate to say it. I hate to say it. William Stedman, happy Christmas from Ireland. Gallen, Falmouth, Cornwall. Wow, Cornwall. That's where my wife's family comes from. Uh, lovely, lovely, gorgeous area in England. Uh, Pro 1000 refill OEM once a year. Enjoying, yes, yes. If you don't print a lot with a printer, and if you print, you know, regularly enough to minimize the number of of uh, preemptive type cleaning cycles, you can last a very long time. Yeah, I'm afraid it is. Jens Ormslev from Iceland. Wow, we're getting all the um, European viewers today. Awesome. Epson 3800 and a Canon Pro 1000. Very good. George is from Cyprus, and that again also a gorgeous area. Merry Christmas, Canon Pro One, Pro Ten, and a Pro One Thousand. Felipe Cañete Torrens from Sarasota, Florida, Canon Pro Two Hundred, and Happy Christmas. Thank you, Felipe. Uh, Cat's Corner says yes, kitties. Look at the kitties. Oh. Everyone has a job to do. Yeah. Henry Stoffel says hi. Wayne J from northern from northwestern Florida. Epson SCP nine hundred. EcoTank eighty five hundred. That's the letter size one. Both with OEM inks, Red River Papers currently working to learn their new metallic canvas. I'm I'm liking what I can get from this paper with HDR photos. Is it a real canvas? Is it a cloth uh, type media or is it a paper that is embossed to look like canvas? I think it's real. Merry Christmas to all from Wayne J. I got back. What is that first little? I don't know what that is. Gallon says, uh, Pro 1000 drill and refill. So you're doing that. Awesome. Very good. All righty. Henry says, Merry Christmas, Jose, from all and all from Medford, Mass. Uh, Epson SCP 100, OEM Inks, and of course, Humage Ultimate. That's the new one. The 24 and 101. Hit the like button, everybody. Yes, please do that. Kevin, I am not even going to try. Brynyarski, Merry Christmas to you and your family. Thank, same to you, my friend. Cat's Corner says, I thought so. Well, slow sing and flower bring it is. Yeah. The, yeah, that printer is still selling for like $350, but you really got to be careful. Um, when you are um, refilling it. I don't know. How did you do that? How did you spill ink inside? Canon 300 and a Pro 10 uh, from Kevin. Charlie Miller says about cat sprinters with flushing it with lots of distilled water, clean it out. I think, he, I, I don't think it's the printhead. I think he spilled ink internally and it's probably on the motherboard. <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Yeah, it is real canvas. Well, good. Let us know how, how it looks. And uh, what did you say you were printing it on? What printer are you using? The, the 8550 would probably work really fine on it. it. It seems to work on just about every media that I throw at it. Let's see how long I can last with this on. It's a little tight. So the, my head is huge. It's a little tight. Now, people are having such inconsistent results still, and it just makes me, you know, lose it a little bit because um, if you just, it's like with anything. If you're if you're cooking something or if you are 
if you paint on canvas and you have a style, but every time you paint, you just use a different style every time, no one will recognize that work as yours because as you begin to get some fame behind you, uh, people tend to associate a certain look, a certain style, and you have no look, you have no style because you're constantly being inconsistent with your approach to your painting. The same thing with cooking. If, if I make, I make this delicious fried rice. It's a Korean dish that I learned from a, this little old lady that I met I, on my way every, every morning. I used to walk to work to my camp from my camp where I live to the camp where I work. And we had to go by this road and go around an airstrip. And there was a little shop and there was always this little old lady cooking on a walk. And I had a friend, one of our Katusa. A Katusa is a Korean augmentation to the United States Army. It's a huge acronym. So this young, I think it was a corporal, um, asked the lady if she could show me how to cook that fried rice, which she did. And I'm famous now for that fried rice. And every time I make it, it is exactly the same because I do not change my recipe and I do not change my preparation of that dish. So I could give it to someone who had it five years ago and they go, oh, I remember this. It's not like, oh, this tastes different. It's not what I remember. You see what I mean? So consistency, 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 consistency. I can't even say that. Is, is the key here. You need to be absolutely consistent. I was not. I was inconsistent when I began doing this. And my first three, four, five years were just a total struggle. And I, I thought I knew it all. I was being, you know, a real you-know-what. And nobody could teach me how to do any of this because I am... I am Jose Rodriguez. I've been doing this since I was eight years old. Yeah, no, baloney. I knew nothing. I was the most ignorant person when it, had, when it came to digital printing. So slowly I began to get some information. You got to remember that was the early era, the early times of digital anything um, as far as imaging went. And really, most people were learning as they went. So at some point, finally, some consistency began to be, uh, you know, introduced by these companies, the printer companies, the ink companies, and so on. And finally, I decided, why don't I just listen to some of this advice and apply it? Boom. I realized, wow, I can print every day of the week and get the same results from a standard image. Finally, there was a standard image. And I realized working in a lab, I, I knew, of course, I need to have my controls for any any kind of a laboratory assay that I run. I have to have a control, a positive control to show that my procedure is working and a negative control so that I would not get a false positive. And that's why you run controls. Your standard image is the control. When it comes to just the printing side of things, but then, you know, you got to remember, I remember a camera that I had that used like a zip disk, this big. You slip that zip disk in there. It had like a couple of megabytes of memory. And that's it. Each image was only like um, 280 by something. And so you could get maybe 10 images in, in that in that zip disk and then you have to take that out of the camera put it in your zip disk reader on your computer probably windows three point something and 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 work from that and what editing software there was no editing software so you open it in windows photo viewer or whatever and then directly print it with what settings you didn't know what settings um, oh, oh! this says here glossy paper. Okay, I'll use glossy paper. And you put the glossy paper, any brand, it didn't matter. And then you continue printing. And you got a semi. You got what looked like a photograph, but it wasn't not even close to what the monitor was displaying. And you accepted that. And you may have then decided, well, I, I need to compensate for the difference in results 
by adding the opposite. If it was too dark, I would brighten the image brighter than it should have been. And it would sort of print looking to me what it would be a normal looking image and so forth. Yeah. Again, we knew nothing. We were just guessing our way through this process. But that that's not the case today. We know what we're doing. And printers have reached their pinnacle for output quality, for gamut, all of this stuff. They are going to be improved in other other areas, such as features and that sort of thing. I think inks can be improved yet a little bit more, but it's almost there. We're almost at the maximum quality that these printers can produce. That is why something as simple as this baby right here can produce such beautiful results with just five colors. You're printing with five colors. Four are just basic yellow, magenta, cyan, black, and they throw in a gray. You're not using both blacks. You're using one black or the other black. But again, the results are amazing. And so, and the reason for that is because, again, most of these printers have reached the point where they can all output wonderful results. Um, the difference between this XP15000, Pro1000, PA100, P900, any of these high-end printers and higher, is it's very minimal. You really, you really have to scrutinize that image really closely to be able to say to yourself, "Oh man, you know this is so much better than my 8550." Well, what if I don't show you the other photo? You're gonna love the 8550s results. Simple as that. It's, it's a matter of you know comparing the two and being super super picky. So how to get the best possible should I say accurate rendition of anything you shoot, edit, and print? Well, nobody ever talks about the camera. So the camera operates with lens and a sensor. Remember the film cameras? You had a lens, you had an aperture, an iris, and they had a shutter. And the shutter would create exposure times that were in fractions of a second. It could have been a long exposure, several seconds, or up to like 1,000, 2,000, 4,000 of a second, depending on how much light you had in the, the scene you were shooting and so forth, or what you wanted to do. If you want to stop action, you're going to use a wide aperture and a high shutter speed, and that will freeze that action. Otherwise, it would be a blur. So what could possibly happen in the digital world with your digital expensive camera that could produce a raw image, none, no manipulation whatsoever, a raw image that when you open it in your raw converter or raw viewer, some of the colors don't quite look the way you remember them being. The sensor, the sensor is not absolutely accurate. It cannot be. This is why they, they came up with something like this. And what this is, it's basically a calibrator for your camera. So I would not recommend that you go out in, in the field and use this unless you're going to be doing a photo shoot, maybe including a model or something, and you can control the lighting, and you're not going to be there all day long as the lighting changes, as the sun moves. Um, you're going to use this probably for studio work under control conditions. So before you even begin shooting, after you've set up your lighting, your subject has been properly located wherever you want it to be, say for still life or advertising type photographer, you're gonna shoot a picture of this. You're gonna put this smack in front of the subject and you take a close up of it so that it includes the whole frame. Then you have some software that they provide you you have to shoot in raw and i think you have to shoot in dng like nikon dng or you have to convert the file if it's some other raw format to a dng when you open up the software now one thing lightroom does not require the software lightroom will immediately allow you to analyze this internally and so here's what you do you're going to shoot this and what do you have you have some control colors 
These are specific values. Okay. You're going to shoot it. You're going to open it in that software. It's going to automatically select each one of those little squares. Basically, you're going to be doing this one is what you're going to be doing. It's going to select each one of those little squares from that image that's in your monitor through that software. And it's going to determine how far off these rendered little squares images, that is, are from the original intended value. So just like a control, this is meant to be blah, 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 yellow. This is meant to be blah, 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 yellow. This is meant to be blah, 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 orange. This is blue. This is a green. This is another green, a cyan, another type of cyan, and so forth. It's going to look at these colors, and it's going to say, okay, this one is perfect. I don't have to do anything to it. The other ones are not, and I have to compensate for that. So that's when you apply that compensation. It will save a profile, per se, and then you load that profile onto your uh, raw files, the whole series that you shot, again, under the same lighting conditions, and it's going to convert them. It's going to apply that correction all the way across the board. Now, your raw files, without you editing anything, not your regular editing, are going to be as perfect as possible, even though your sensor may not have been able to reproduce some of those colors. It's going to correct that. I have done it on shots that I did at Disney World with a relatively cheap Nikon, I think it's a D3 3300 camera. I had a D90 as well. And when you apply that, that, that correction, you see colors changing. Whoa. Oh, that was supposed to be red? Wow. Yeah, there it is. Oh, that was supposed to be a deep green? Yeah, now you can really get a deep. And you'll see that on your monitor. So now you're ready to edit. Well, to edit, you better have a perfectly calibrated monitor. And to do that, you need a calibrator. This is about as low a cost as you can get. Right now, the Data Color Spider X Elite. It works just fine. It's a simple unit to use. So you're going to take a reading on directly off of your screen, and it's going to run a bunch of different color values for you, and it's going to then correct. It's all about reading a, a value and correcting it. So here's the thing. It's going to send, say, a value of red, any some sort of red. It, it's going to do an RGB, first of all, a full, pure RGB, so only your your red, green, and blue diodes, or whatever you want to call them, will be activated. And then it's going to run other values, other colors, different different mixtures of colors. And so it's going to flash that color. It's going to read it. And it's going to say, this is not correct. I am not reading the value I'm supposed to be getting here. It's off in this direction. Let me apply a correction to neutralize that error. And it does that. And it'll run multiple values, multiple tones, different densities, and so forth. And at the end, you're going to have a calibrated monitor. You're going to have a profile that is saved and is actually utilized by your graphic card. When you restart your computer, mine will go, will show me the actually true horrific result I had without profiling. And all of a sudden, it just changes. And you see it become, wow, this is perfect. That other one was yellowish. You see, so now your monitor is calibrated. And what does that mean? It means that when I, if I was to load um, something gray, I don't know, 125, 125, 125 RGB, it's going to look gray. It's not going to look yellowish. Even though the value is neutral and it should be a gray, but the monitor displays it as some other tone, your monitor is not calibrated. So it has to display it as a neutral gray. You look at it, believe me, you'll get used to this. You look at it and you can tell, oh, that's that's neutral. Or no, that's that's yellowish. You see what I mean? So another thing that you, you need to do is get that brightness controlled, okay? Even though your monitor's color, your temperature, what they call the white point, might be perfect, in other words, and it could be neutrally, linearly neutral, where 
black all the way to white as a graduated ramp does not change tone, okay? It doesn't change tone. But when you look at the black side, you see that that black looks a little bit lit. It looks a little bit brighter than black. In other words, if you take a really close look, black should be where the diodes, or again, I don't know what they're really called, are not even emitting light. They're just off, basically. Black should be off. And then all the way to white. So if you see like the first four or five steps off, in other words, you cannot determine anything in between those four or five, six, seven, eight steps, your monitor is too dark. Okay, so you have to increase the density. And that is the, what do they call that? Now I forget. It's, it's a little equation. So for me, I set it to CD, oh, CD M280, CD80 M2, something like that. And normally a CD120, which is entirely too bright for this kind of environment here. If you work in a, in a highly lit or brightly lit environment, then you need to increase your density of your monitor. But then the problem is that your black point doesn't look black anymore. You see, it's like when you're at the theater and you're looking at the previews and some of the ambient lights are still on and everything looks dull. It doesn't really look great. And then the lights come on and the real feature movie comes on and everything is just beautiful. What's black looks black. It doesn't have any light on it. It looks absolutely black. And then the next step up, you see a little bit of light on there. And that's the way it should be. So that is the happy point. You have to experiment. You have to experiment with your CDM2 um, numbers. For me, again, like I said, 80 is just perfect for my environment here. So when I look at my standard image that I print, and again, with color managed workflow, and I compare it to my monitor, the same image being projected at me, it looks the same. My monitor does not look brighter than my print. My print does not look darker than my monitor. That's the most common problem, a darker print. It might be, cor the color balance might be correct. It's a neutral result, it's just simply too dark. Maybe one have stopped too dark. Well, that means your monitor is too bright. So would that show up on a standard image? No. Here's the, here's the reason why. When you open up your standard image, your control, this is how you determine how good that printer is. You open up your control image. You can either do this on this printer load epson paper if that was a canon printer i would load canon paper in the driver settings under color or color management you have several choices you're going to choose first of all that very same paper on your menu and then icm i c m icm is a mode that will then link your paper choice to the installed profile for that paper. You're letting the driver control color and it's doing it perfectly because it's actually using a, a, a color managed workflow. It is automatically linking the paper you chose to the installed ICC matching profile, okay? Now set it to the rendering intent relative colorimetric, not, not, the, not perceptual. Relative colorimetric, your standard image should not be altered in any way. Perceptual, perceptual will alter your colors, your gamut. It will squeeze out of gamut areas in so it, they can be sort of printed. Uh, but no, don't do that. Your standard image, relative colorimetric, and black point compensation on. There are some arguments about that, but trust me. Black point compensation. You print there, you're going to look at it. You've seen me look at my standard images a million times, and it looks correct. You see black, you see the next step up, and all the way to white. White would be just the paper, no ink. That's two, 255. So if you get that, then you know your printer is outputting correctly. So does it match my monitor? Does my perfect print match? what the monitor is displaying, that image that I open without editing. If it does, that's it. 
Santa just gave you a Christmas present that you will not regret. You're good to go. If it does not match, however, then you got to go back to your editing software. Your, your not editing software, but your your um, spectrophotometer or or color colorimic. Uh, what is it? Ah, uh, I can't even think today. Your color col colorimeter. Yeah, that's it. I almost said colonoscopy, colorimeter, and and just change your your adjustments a little bit. Make sure that it's always D sixty five delta sixty five. Monitors are set to daylight value, and your profiles we will not get to that yet are d50 so don't get confused don't worry don't analyze that don't don't lose sleep over it accept it d65 and profiles are d50 okay now now that you have a matching result monitor matches your standard image result now you can trust it to do what edit because why are you editing why does anyone edit any image? How many of you open your raw image, whether you view it in Lightroom, in Q image, in Photoshop, then send it over to Photoshop as a PSD? How many of you just immediately print from that? Probably not even 1%. I knew a man who did. He did not want to touch his raw image. That should be perfect. No, it's not. Okay, it's going to be a lot duller than you remember it being. You're going to have to help it a little bit. So that re that requires editing. And so when you edit, what are you doing? You're making these adjustments. You're really being so, so finicky and so careful, adding a little bit of density here. You're dodging, you're burning in, you're, uh, you know, changing the shadows a little bit, density a little bit more. Everything, color, you name, you name it, saturation, sharpness. And how do you know that what you're seeing is true? You, you just don't. You just don't. But if your image of that standard uh, evaluation uh, image looks correct on your monitor and it matches your output, because remember, you did not edit it at all. All you did was print with the driver, ICM mode, that linked Canon paper to the matching Canon profile, that linked Epson paper to the matching Epson profile. Assuming, of course, you chose the correct name on the drop-down menu. That print comes out, you look at it, it's perfect. It looks perfect. Compare it to your monitor, that also matches perfectly. Now you can trust it. Now you can edit quickly or take an hour editing, whatever. It, it doesn't matter. You know that what you are producing, the changes you are making, will be reflected on your prints that you printed with the printer that you uh, are 100% sure is printing correctly because your standard image printed correctly. It's controls. It's all about controls. So... Now, now you're changing to another paper, some other paper. Now, let me just tell you that there are only like seven inkjet paper mills in the world, seven or eight, just a handful of them. There's a bunch of other paper mills, but they don't necessarily produce inkjet paper. So a lot of the, a lot of the papers that are being sold under different brands basically come from the same mill. They may apply a different embossing to the surface to make it look differently, but the coating is the same. The thickness of the paper is the same. The base color of the paper is the same. And so other than the fact that the texture might be a little bit different, it, it seems to produce the same results. So, however... You still need a, an ICC profile. You can get away with using a similar paper's ICC profile. For example, if you have a Canon Pro Luster and you're using a Pro Luster paper from another brand, and you compare it visually, you see that it's the same base color. You might get away with just using Canon Pro Luster, but of course, it's always better to use a custom profile. The custom profile will will remove any slight differences in output 
that paper would cause your image to have. It will neutralize that. It will then bring it down to a middle point where you know that even, even if the paper was a slightly bit more yellowish than the Canon equivalent, it's going to it's going to take care of that slight yellowish background. Okay. It's going to neutralize that. Your finished result, your paper base will still be slightly yellow, but your printer result will be more toward what would have uh, uh, occurred on on the same sort of matching surface, Canon or Epson paper. It's, it's critical to use a custom profile. I do that all the time. I make my own, and I that gives me the very best results for that particular batch of paper. Remember, paper is made on, in batches. How consistent is it? They're consistent, but they're still, there's still going to be slight differences. The same thing with inks, okay? That's why every so often, if I go through, say, precision colors, inks, and I, I know I have gone through many, many bottles of their ink, how do I know that their supply that they just received matches their previous supply that lasted all year? You see what I mean? So you got to sort of do, if you see any changes in your results, you got to do a, a new profile. You have to create a brand new profile for that to compensate for that. Was that too long hair for you? I hope not. But again, consistency is the key. That's why, and I just read today, somebody's having problems with QImage. Oh, come on. I go like, please. Yes, QImage has a very unique user interface. They've had the same interface since early 2000. Uh, they're not about to change it. You have to learn it and get used to it because the beauty of using QImage is it's made for printing. Its sole job is to print. And so I don't understand what people are having problems with. Now, as far as you, for, for instance, me, I have 16, 17 printers. How the heck am I going to remember? This old man doesn't remember what I did yesterday. So how the heck am I going to remember 16 or 17 different setting requirements for just one paper? But I have 30 different papers. I save the settings in QImage. Open, look for that setting for that paper, that printer, that size. Click, apply it. It sets all my settings back to what I know were correct to begin with because that's how I did those settings. I made sure that my results were correct to begin with. Okay, I'm having perfect results. I'm going to save that because tomorrow I'll forget what I did. So I'm not relying on my memory. I'm relying on QImage to help me bring those settings back. And now all I have to do is add images. That's it. And guess what? It prints perfectly. It does. There's no other way it can, it can screw up. Um, printing. On the printing side, you either let the driver, you guys all know this. I'm repeating myself here. You either let the driver control color if you're using the brand paper that that printer uses, Canon or Epson. There are other brands out there I know, but we don't talk about HP or any of the other brands. We stick with Canon and Epson because they're dedicated photo printers. That's what they have. And they have a ton of other household type printers that we really don't deal with too much for photos. They produce good photos. They produce reasonably good photos. Don't get me wrong. But for your high-end photo printers, you either let the driver control color, you load that paper that you bought some paper, you look it up on the menu, choose it, the size, then go into color mode and choose ICM. It will load that particular matching ICC profile. The ICC profile got loaded when you installed the driver. It exists in your hard drive. On a Mac, it's a little bit different. I think you have to copy them. I'm not sure. But in Windows, it just installs it automatically. And they're buried inside the Windows folder anyway. Don't worry about it. It will find it and load that. And so you don't have to deal too much with that. Now, in QImage, when you let the driver control color, when you say let the driver control color, it will automatically do that for you. It'll set it to ICM. It'll match the profile for you. If you tell QImage to control color, it will turn off the driver's color management 
That's the most important thing I've said so far. It will turn off the driver's color management. So it's not controlling color anymore. Q image is controlling color. And then you have to manually look for that profile. If you're using a Canon paper on a Canon printer, Epson paper and Epson printer, you just say, suggest a profile for me. And you use Canon Pro Luster, guess what's going to be on the top list of your profiles? And if you only have one printer, you may have only 20 profiles to deal with. I have hundreds. On top will be that paper's profile. Click, choose, OK, print, done. It's not going to double profile. Double profiling will give you horrendous results, OK? And you do that all the time, believe me, on other applications. You make that mistake. Oh, wait, what? what? Like me? Yes. Oh, yeah. I did it all the time. I didn't know what was causing these horrible results. My printer driver was controlling color, and I was controlling color. Oh, I am going to use an ICC profile in my application, double profiling, you see. So it, it happened, it, believe me, uh, I don't wanna downplay this, but I, it happened to me so many times, I got tired of it. I really got tired of it. And I finally said, wait, you know what? I should, I should listen to some of these folks and uh, stop being such a jerk. And, uh, and I don't mean you guys are jerks, I'm just me. I was the, I was the jerk. Let, let me just pay attention, let me apply these recommended settings and this recommended approaches to printing so that I can get consistent results. Boom, done. That's all it took. God, my glasses are dirty. I shouldn't be doing so. I'm going to be getting new glasses anyway pretty soon. I already got my, my exam done. I just got to decide what to get. All right, so in order for you to get consistent results, like I could just print right now with, say, the... Photo Paper Pro Premium Matte from Canon, 8550. I got a setting already saved. I open up that setting, save it. All I got to do is throw some photos at it, load some paper, print it, go to the bathroom, come back, and they're going to be as I expect. They're going to match my monitor. They are, okay? Just recently, I made a profile. You guys saw my chart that I had here last week. And that was for that cheaper, uh, it's matte photo paper. And there's a choice for that in your driver. But the paper is just like, if the pro version is 100%, this is like 80% quality. Uh, the ability to produce a nice deep black is just very limited. It just simply will not give you the correct or the, the same type of black. Even though I'm trying to fool the printer into thinking that I am loading the high-end paper. Because when you load and choose that particular type of paper, it triggers the matte black ink. Well, if I make the, the profile using that particular paper type, but the cheaper paper, it should think that I am printing on the fine paper. It will then trigger the matte black. I should get a similarly close enough result. Holy mackerel. I'm going to get a paper towel. Hang on. If you do not, then you probably did not choose the paper type that triggers the use of matte black. Why do they do that? That question haunts me. I don't know why printer companies do that. I don't know why the heck anyone would force you to, if you're printing on matte media and you want the matte black ink to be activated, then activate it. Okay, regardless of the the level of quality of the matte media might be, it, it, you know, it should have nothing to do with that. But no, Canon and Epson apparently do that, and so it's it's really, really uh, something that I wonder about. What were they thinking? But I have no explanation. I have not been able to find any reason for that to occur. Same thing happens behind me. I could print choosing plain paper mode, standard image. I could print then on, say, a glossy 
paper from Epson and a matte paper from Epson, but I don't choose anything that would trigger the matte black. Guess which one has the deepest black, the plain paper one, because it triggers matte black. Imagine that. So, and I think in the case of this printer, maybe that's the only reason that they have a matte black is for, for you to be able to get when you're printing your regular text files or documents and you're printing on regular matte, uh, regular uh, plain paper, it will produce a nice deep um, text, in other words. But who knows? Who knows what they're doing? All right. So that is going to be it for that, that subject. How long did we talk? Good Lord. It's almost been an hour. Um, I'm going to stay on till about maybe 2.30 today, and then we'll get ready to go to um, my uh, son-in-law's. Um, but anyway, let me go ahead and see what else we got here on the chat. I've I seen a fuse F1 on F2 motherboard. It it could be. I mean, again, if you if you see, do you see anything on the motherboard physically? Um, something. Um, what do they call that? From that you would not normally find, like ink. Um, uh, anything foreign? There you go. That's the word. Um, Again, um, if it fried something, then really there's no way to repair that. But again, if it just blew a fuse, then possibly. But again, that would have to be diagnosed by a technician. He would have to check to make sure that's, that's the case. Wayne J says, printing on the, on, from the metallic canvas with the, the P... A nine nine thousand. Wonder how that looks. Metallic canvas. Wow, that's that's a different one. Maybe I will ask um, Red River to send me a sample of that. Five years? No, I said two days. Uh, don't ask me what I did yesterday. Oh yeah, we were driving home. That you know, duh. <laughs> I can't remember what I ate for breakfast. Yeah. What did I eat for breakfast? I forgot. <laughs> Roger Jones, happy holidays from Portland, Oregon. Yes, it is rainy today using P800, but ink's gotten expensive. What day is your scanning channel? What day is your scanning channel on? I don't have a scanning channel. Just this on weekends. And I want, you know, I might do a video during the week. Assuming I got some time or I feel like doing it. No, I don't have a scanning channel. I have a Facebook group. John Fletcher, Keith Cooper has just taken delivery of a SCP-5300. What is that? I've heard about that, but I don't know what it is as far as the uh, type of printer. <laughs> yeah, well, hey. The Greek food comes from my my son-in-law, Gregorio Papalukas. And his father, rest in peace, used to be a wine distributor throughout Baltimore. And, of course, guess what he concentrated on? All the Greek restaurants in Little Greece. Um, made a very good living doing that, by the way. Octothorpe, what do you think of Mirage for printing? That is a RIP or a uh, raster image processor. I really have not had any experience using RIPs myself. Um, but those that do use them, they swear by them. They love them. They prefer them to the uh, printer drivers because there's so much I can control with it. So that's all I can tell you. I don't have much of experience with them. John Fletcher, QMH released an update two to three days ago. Yes, I know. I got I got word of that. Um, and I think QMH1 also did that. 
Kat says, happy holidays to you and your family. Many thanks for sharing all your time and knowledge. You are a blessing to us all. Well, thank you. You guys are a blessing to me because you keep me, you guys keep me active. I would be a vegetable if I didn't have you guys come every week to watch me blab and talk. So thank you so much. I do appreciate that. Rudy Hallamum, we have you have a beautiful hat. Merry Christmas. Yes. Where's my there you go? Three days ago I got a B200 error on my Pro 100. Try several hard starts, but it didn't help. Then I flushed the printhead using my hand cleaner. And then what? Did it solve it? Usually it's, it's, it has to do with contacts. That's why, uh, as Mike Mike uh, Lee has been preaching lately, is you know he wants us to uh, keep those contacts clean, maintain those contacts. That way they don't eventually become so bad that there's no no. Uh, no fixing in other words it doesn't matter how well you clean them they're never going to be able to uh communicate b200 is a communicating error communication error but it could be other reasons it could be um caused by the uh the uh, actual um motherboard or logic board you just don't know worst scenario is you buy one and it'll run you at least 300 dollars new uh, you shouldn't accept anything that is refurbished. We're gonna we're gonna talk about refurbish, uh, what that really means. Um, you put it on and it'll work for a while, but the error, the problem was with the motherboard, so it's going to cause a short circuit or something bad to happen later on anyway. I haven't went in that fall. Um, I'll move on. What? I don't know what that means, my friend. Martin says, when will Mike Cheney appear? Well, he sent me a, an email just recently, and uh, he's going to be on early January. Um, I think he is done with all of his private um, issues that he was having after his friend died. He was the, uh, what is it, the estate, running the estate for him, and so... Once he is done with that and uh, was able to produce a couple of updates, so he told me that early, early January. Felix Sepulveda Fotografia. Hi all, I bought a, I just bought an Epson EcoTank 8550. I know it's not pigment printer, but ink is, but ONS ink is pigment. I think you mean the black. Based on your experience and judgment, how long these inks will last? Nobody really knows. They haven't really done any testing, any kind of scientific testing on that. Whether they, groups like Ardenberg, they're the ones that really uh, do uh, ink testing. Uh, maybe they will test it. Who knows? So far, anything that I've dealt with has not faded. How old is my printer? I don't know. Not even a year old yet. I haven't went in that far in the system. Okay, I'll move on. Sorry about the typo. Thanks for your help. So, yeah, check it out and see if it's fixable. If not, your only option, of course, is a new one. I tried printing a 7x10 print on paper that requires a manual feeder, but it rejects it. So... This one is simple. He's printing on a fancy high or fine art paper that calls for feeding on the rear, the way in the back, manual feeder. And uh, the reason for that is because if you feed from the top or you feed from like this printer here with the tray, it has to make that sharp U-turn. These papers cannot bend like that and they will fail. The, the feed, the initial feed will fail. Um, top feeder, the initial feed might fail. So the rear feeder is more of a straight, almost a straight approach to the intake roller and the rest of the feeding. The problem is 7 by 10 is not a standard paper size. It's, it's a custom paper size. 
and you have to use only standard papers sizes eight by ten five by seven eleven you know eight and a half by eleven eleven by fourteen eleven by seventeen sixteen by twenty you know the drill all of those papers are considered standard size and they can be fed through the manual feeder what is happening to him is using something like the 8550 and what happens is the uh the paper tray is activated okay because he has no choice and i told him check your choice of where you're feeding from it could be it could be if he has been a standard size but the paper is coming from the tray you did not choose the correct feeder on your on your driver you have to manually choose that i think we discussed this sort of but People, again, are getting not the black they expect. They're talking about D-Max. And D-Max basically means it's a measure of your deepest black that your printer can produce. And the lower the number, the, the blacker it is. So how to get the deepest black. So you got a printer like the Pro 10, Pro 300. And they do have photo black and they do have matte black ink. And again, the only way to activate that that deeper matte black ink or the pigment ink, they're all pigment, but one of them is, is matte, is to use the rear feeder. But to use the real real the rear feeder, you have to choose a paper that is found in the fine art menu. So not the regular photo paper menu. That will use photo black, photo black ink not the deep deep uh, matte black ink you have to choose like something that's fine art that happens to be matte and it'll it's going to force you to feed it through the rear manual feeder anyway and then to top it off it's going to add a border something like a 25 to 30 millimeter border leading and trailing edge the only way to take advantage of something like that would be for instance, if you're printing on a 13 by 19, yeah, I could live with a 25 inch border on an art print. That's not a problem. That way I can sign it and it, there's no issues. But on an 8 by 10, who the heck wants, you know, over an inch border leading and trailing? And it's going to force you to do that because it needs to make sure that the paper is not printing on the unsupported edges. The leading and trailing edges are not supported. And so it, it wants to make sure that you the paper has advanced enough so that the front edge is actually now supported, grabbed under the rollers. Otherwise, it could be curling up a little bit. You'll get head strikes. And remember, you're using expensive paper. You're using expensive papers for for, for you to then you know, be able to use the, the, the manual feeder in the back. Um, so again, it has to be, it has to be, I hate it. I hate it the way that they have come up with this uh, reason. Um, but it has to be a fine art paper for you to be able to trigger. And apparently that's what the 8550 also does. Okay. Imagine that. I didn't think Epson would ever do that. But according to Mike, they do that as well. There's got to be some reason for it. I don't know. Okay. Profile targets. They're printing too small. Let me quickly open Q image. I'm not going to say anything, folks, but you notice that something has not turned off. If you were here last week, you know what I went through. With you guys. Let me quickly set this up without you guys having to be bored watching me. So I'm going to load a standard, not a standard image, but a, um, a profile image. Profile chart, that is. Let me close that, open that, look at photos and charts.
And I'll, I'll just be able to easily show you what the issue is, okay? So I have these charts open. So I have a set of three. That's, that's the most accurate way, but you're going to burn through three sheets of paper. So I make a 400 patch single sheet. That's it's good enough. It's good enough. Now, if I have this setup right here, eight and a half by 11, that should be the paper you always use. But if I load this, notice it's small. Yeah, I can still scan it possibly, but it's, it's small. It should fill the whole paper without going beyond the edges. So the way to achieve this is to basically, I'm going to close that, go to print. You can use fit to page or original size. These files are made to be a specific size. And so if I just choose original size, boom, it fits it perfectly. And see, this is your, your edge, your boundary, and it's still within the edges of the paper. It has not, it has not spilled over. So the person was having problems with the, the files loading too small. So again, I repeat, these, these profile charts are a specific size. And you just simply choose original size. You don't want them bigger. You don't want them smaller. Just the original size. Let's just try the other ones. It's one of the one of the three. See that? It fits perfectly. The frame around it is not beyond the edges. Okay. So that is a very very simple way. Do not use any other any other type of feeding. Or, or sizing or any any of that sort. Just original size when you are downloading. If you download these from me, okay, and you are going to print them and then send me that set of prints for me to make you a profile, which would cost you, I think, $30 to do, um, you, you're going to do this. This is the, the most critical part of this exercise. So we're going to load that image. Again, original size. Let's say we're using presentation matte paper for my Epson 8550. I'm going to go ahead and wait a minute. What setting should I use? <gasps> this has to be completely raw. Nothing, nothing should affect this image as it is being printed. I don't want the driver to do it. And I definitely don't want QImage to apply that profile. No. So you're going to, this is the only piece of printing software that would allow you to do this correctly. So if you're ever going to print charts for profiling, you have to use QImage. Okay. Click on that. Set it to off. It's going to tell you this big old warning. We're going to read it. Turning. I'm going to move it over here so I can see it clearly. Turning printing ICC off will disable printer color management and will result in raw data being sent to the printer. This option is normally and only used when printing color test targets, such as those used to create custom printer profiles. If you want your printer slash driver to manage color using its own built-in profiles, select let the printer driver manage color so this is not for you to be printing your photos with definitely not ex exclusively only for printing profile charts are you sure you want to turn printer color management off and you say yes okay i save this as a setting so i don't have to do what i just went through i just look it up right here I load that setup and I am done. Now I can load my charts and print them and they will print correctly. Okay. Are you are you wondering, you know, if you're wondering um, why do I have to do that? Because you're trying to then scan that result and determine where the errors are in reproduction. So you cannot have the application Q image, for instance, you know, stick stick their fingers in in the uh, 
color management of it or you or the driver nobody cannot be no one can be trying to adjust color the printer alone prints it and then you scan it and the scan each one of those little patches will be scanned and the errors will be found and the errors will be corrected and the profile will be created and then you're ready to print your own photos when you print your own photos then you're just going to tell the driver to control color so you have a profile such as that one being used and this is the one we're going to uh, be using on the uh, that cheap photo map paper in a little bit okay even margins oh lord okay so in case you didn't know printer drivers force you to accept these uneven margins the left and right margin might be the same width but the leading and trailing edge margins definitely are not so in order for you to be able to set up something with an even border I'm going to have to go back to QImage. Hang on one sec. You're going to have to do this. Let's go back to that same that same setup we had, but let's 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 look for a photograph instead. Not that. Here we go. Just some quick snapshots that I took uh, driving around one day. So if I if I was to load this, I cannot use the original size. Oh, sorry, you cannot see what I'm talking about. If I was to load this, for instance, this image here, I could not possibly use original size. The image is huge. If I do that, it's going to say, "Hey." The size is larger than one page. I'm going to have to use multiple pages. Well, no, 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 no. We don't want that. We don't want that. So let's go ahead and choose fit to page. Now, notice, if you will, the difference in margins. Okay. And up here, it tells you exactly what the margins widths are, or actually, what the printed area is. Remember, this is 8.5 by 11 paper, but only 8.266, I believe that's what it says, and 10.766 is actually printing. Okay? So that, that's a bit odd, isn't it? And 720 by 720, that, what is that about? That is your pixel resolution. Why? Why 720? Because it's twice 360. The native resolution of Epson printers is 360. So it's going to improve the results that you get. It took my image and reinterpolated it and changed it to 720 by 720. This is going to be as good as it gets. Okay. Now, did they get did this? Did this get cropped? Let's select it. And hit nope. Here's the on cropped. It did enlarge it a little bit. You know why? Because I set it to auto crop. So it's going to fill the complete area. Okay. Now let's go to cropping still. I want to crop. I want to fill the area as much as possible. It really doesn't matter if I print it this way or that way. You know, there's the azaleas are still there. It's not going to really affect. If I want an even border, I have to then select create a border that excels the widest one of those borders here. Maybe this one or this one. So I think quarter inch will work. Let's go here, more, and we're going to go to enter border size, 0.25. Now I got a perfectly even centered image you see that i excelled you can still see slightly gray the unprintable uh margins and this is this is normal 
on all printers. But I selected a border that is wider than the widest unprintable uh, margin. And so I basically hacked it. Okay. Now my image, which is being cropped, fits perfectly. I got quarter inch, quarter inch, quarter inch, quarter inch. Okay. Remember that. There are unprintable margins and you cannot you cannot change that. It's just part of the whole the, the world of printers, okay? It exists that way. There's nothing else you can do about it. Someone came up with an idea. This is a good one. And I, I dreamed about this as well. I thought, could this possibly be something that could be introduced? Then I, the more I thought about it, the more I talked to Mike about it as well, uh, we decided this is never going to happen. It's just never going to happen. Someone came up with the idea of a printer to have a tank of clear ink base that would be triggered to perform cleaning cycles. Here's why this will never happen. Uh, think about it. Printers that are driving you crazy with cleaning cycles, such as the what? Canon printers. And again, there's there's a way to get around that. Just use them. Use them, use them frequently. And they will not have to run a cleaning cycle prior to the print being sent to it. Simple as that. But the idea here is the theory here would be that there would be a separate tank. Like this is your normal ink tank, 80 milliliters. Say you would have something like this maybe or larger or better yet. Oh, boy. Something like this, 700 milliliters. Well, where are you going to stick that? Okay, on a, on a Pro 1000. That will make the printer larger. But then you got a problem. The pathway of ink begins at the cartridge, goes in through the ink spigot that mates with the cartridge exit port. It fills the internal vented compartment. That's the way it, it keeps counting how many how many replenishments of that little that little tank uh, occur during the lifetime of that that cartridge. And then from there, it goes on the ink lines that you see visible when you open up the lid into the printer. This is a Pro 1 equivalent. Inside this big old print head live 12 cartridges or dampers. Those dampers are also filled with ink. And then finally, the ink goes into the channels and feeds the printhead and you print from that point on how would you introduce in 12 channels clear fluid okay regardless of how you do it the the, the only possible way would be somehow to have 12 little ink lines going into the beyond the dampers where the actual channel space is with all the little nozzles and they're microscopic and start feeding clear fluid from there. And that would expel whatever ink was left, minute amount of ink and use that cleaning. How do you know it's clean? It's clear, clear fluid. You cannot run, you know, a test to see if it's, if it's clean or not. So then you have to then go back and re re prime those, those little chambers with ink and then run and also check and by golly is okay it's a hundred percent because the other way if you do it from beyond beyond that or or upstream from that guess what you got to do you got to flush out all that ink if you were complaining about ink being wasted you have no idea how much ink would be wasted doing something like upstream and, and using that clear fluid to perform a head clean. No, it would have to be directly to the head. The head is replaceable. When you install that head 
are you want do you want to install 12 little tubings into that head and possibly mess up something you see what i mean it makes no sense at all it's a pipe dream it's a wonderful idea but it, it, it just simply will not work now on a regular pro 10 on a regular 100 pro 100 it could work you would have to have cartridges a set of cartridges loaded with the clear fluid and you would literally have to put it on the central change position remove the 10 or 8 cartridges replace them with the clear cartridges run a cleaning cycle it would flush out the ink you still have no clue whether it's it's clean or not whether it's printing 100 percent unless that clear fluid has a bit of color this is why you know inkjet malls pso flush solution is pink so you can tell when you run a nozzle check that yeah you clean your printhead but those are only for for epson printers we're talking canon so you would have to have a dyed clear with clear dye uh, type of a uh, of uh, uh, clear fluid so that then you, after you run your cleaning cycle you can then run a nozzle check and see if that was affected then you got to remove those eight or ten cartridges replace it with your regular ink cartridges close the lid it will go to the right it will run a perch cycle it will then flush out the clear fluid <laughs> you really want to do that yeah it, it, it's possible yes it is possible but you know it's a bit of a, a, a it takes a bit of planning okay but it would work it would work in, under those conditions on a printer that has cartridges that ride along with the print head assembly not the stationary cartridge printers no that you have to flush everything out it will cost you a freaking fortune to then re reestablish your ink flow in other words reprime your system if you were complaining about a cleaning cycle this is a complete reprime unless some magical way they can actually begin feeding that clear fluid at the printhead channels themselves that will take a ridiculous amount of engineering and you're not going to want to go through that installation process yourself okay no way i wouldn't want to do it <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. With Color Monkey and C1 printing the target with no color management, Q image works fine. With data color one work, you have to work you to choose Epson RGB profile um no you, you you on apps you're not supposed to use any kind of color management in the printer set it to none i don't know what you're getting at here rgb profile no tim miller the epson p5300 in the us in europe it is the 5370 us it is a replacement oh, okay they already replaced that Wow, uh, it used to be a replacement for the 4900. Okay, I never knew that was only a 17 inch uh, roll printer. I thought it was bigger than that. Mm. It's supposed to be really good. Oh, sure, sure. Use the application that comes with the spectrophotometer or the color emitter, and it will it will produce the file for you. And you print it, but you got to tell the driver no color management at, at all okay the application or software for the colorimeter spectrophotometer is not going to apply anything so it's just like q image what i'm saying is that if you are at home and you want to print these charts you don't have a colorimeter or a spectrophotometer you can download the charts from me and then you can then print them you're going to have to use q image okay because you don't have that software okay it's only for people that do not have that software. Many companies that are doing um, 
um, so-called uh, custom profiles, they ask you to download the, their chart files. And then they tell you how to print them. John Fletcher, 53 is a merge between the, oh, interesting. So they use the same print heads, okay. Oh, is it? The P800 and P900 is different print head, right? P800 is eight channels, P900 is 10, if I remember. Mm-hmm. Are we trying to print longer than, yeah. The hang thing, do you know of a reliable source of new Canon printers? No, not really. Uh, only only, uh, only for maybe current printers. Uh, let me see. I, I do know of, of a source, but quite often they, they are out of stock. So let me check and see. Sometimes Amazon will have them, um, you know, uh, even eBay, but you got to be careful what you're buying. Let me see if I could find this site. Nah. They just have to be, you know, they have to be um, in the original um, box or wrapping. Don't trust anything else. You would think that you could order directly from Canon, but it, it just seems like, nah, that's not really their thing. Hmm, okay. Yeah. I've always sort of bordered on something that large, but I really don't need it. I really don't. Somebody was asking about the, uh, they saw my little bit of a demo using the WIC or WIC tool to reset your, your waste counters using uh, the uh, real number. Um, you, you know, basically you bring your printer back to life. It was dead. It was ready to go to the landfill because there's no other way to do it. Uh, you either buy a new printer or take it to the repair shop. They have to dismantle the whole printer just to get at the internal pads, remove them, clean the inside, put new pads on, install the chassis, make sure you do it correctly so you don't have any errors when you power it back on. And then you got to reset the counters back to zero using special so software, special logon credentials, under yeah you have to be able to log on to their server this is canon that is or epson even and so what happens is that if you can for just ten dollars bring your printer back to life and if it's a printer that you can divert the flow of that waste ink to an outside bottle per se rather than continue dumping them internally you can just basically every several years even bring your printer back to life. This is very simple. And so, but the person was wondering where you can do that, whether you can do that to this or some other EcoTank printer. And I said, no, or any printer from Epson that has what? User replaceable waste ink cartridges. No, you can't do that. It's only for printers with internal waste ink pads. They do not have waste ink cartridges that you, the consumer, can just purchase and replace as needed. Like that printer, like that printer, a 15,000, like the Pro 1000, like the P800, P900, P700. All of these printers have internal waste ink um, cartridges that you can replace yourself. 
So why then, you know, sure, they have in, independent or individual resetters available from China that can reset the chip. But if your paths are saturated to the point where if you run it for any length of time, you might overflow, then you, yeah, you can get away with doing that, but you got to keep kind of your eye uh, on those uh, cartridges. Make sure you don't have a mess in your hands soon down the road. You know, in other words, um, yeah, you can do that. And uh, Rick Johnson, a viewer here, has everything you need to replace those internal pads on those those uh, cartridges. He also sells um, third-party cartridges that are a little bit cheaper than the original ones. Both of them are easy to reset and repack. And again, when this is declared full, I have I have basically reset the chip and put it put it back in and let it run another cycle. No danger. It's very they are declared full extremely prematurely. Okay, that's been my experience. So I think you get the re, the the resetter is not cheap. So it would take many many resets to you to recoup the money. But still, you know, it's better than throwing five of those things in the in the garbage. You know, just reuse them. I'm not a tree hugger type, but come on, it makes no sense to throw those things out. They'll be here for millennia later on. Uh, somebody digging up um, Kensington, Maryland will find uh, Joe's wasting cartridges. I wonder what the heck those things are. Yeah, they'll still be here. Refurbished print heads. Let me let me quickly jump over to eBay. And give you an example, what I am referring to. Then I'm going to give you some information. All right. So, how about Pro One Hundred Print Head? See that? Where's the original wrapper? What they do is they take, okay, here's a brand new one. That's what you're going to pay. That is what you're going to pay. Now, this guy claims that this is a nozzle check from this printhead. Maybe. So again, it's just endless, okay? 235 for one that's not even in the original wrapping. This is this is original. So you get something like this. Find the cheapest one you can find that is still in its original wrapping. It doesn't have to be in the box. It's fine. And buy that instead. Okay. Now let's let's talk. Let's talk a little bit of theory here. So that that refurbished printhead. What do, what do they mean by refurbishing? I took this out of my 9500 Mark II. Okay, you cannot see inside. Here we go. So those are the ink ports. Here's the nozzle plate. Two groups, five channels each. So what do they do? If you notice, let me get a Pro 10 cartridge basically they look like this you notice that there's the little white center and then an oval that oval matches this so this will set flat against that and it will seal so what they have these these groups in china they have an adapter that they have created that simply fits and seals against those ports. Kind of like cartridges, if you will. And then they have cleaning solution that they hopefully not forcibly feed through the system. And each one of these channels, there are five in each group, will create a spray pattern that looks like a fan. 
And they are carefully looking at that. If you see one of the little sprays sort of diverting in a different direction, it's got something causing it to do that. So they continue to clean, 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 clean. And eventually they're all spraying water or cleaning fluid. Then they run water, distilled water through it, and then they are dried. Well, drying is actually bad. I used to think you had to dry it, but drying is actually bad. When you buy a brand new print head, it is filled with glycol. There's liquid inside. Okay, and that liquid is pushed out. So it's never allowed to be bone dry. So once they get it cleared, they call it refurbished. Do they put it on a printer? And do they add ink cartridges? And do they test it? No, because then you will get a print head that has ink in it. And you would be a little bit suspicious. But, you know, that would be the only way to test it, to see if it's actually printing fully, like the one I showed you that had a nozzle uh, test print next to it. How do I know that came from that? You would have to be very trusting. So here's why this may sometimes work, the refurbishing, that is, may sometimes work. Print heads for Canon print heads, printers have redundant nozzles, especially the high-end printers. So what happens, I think on the 8550, I counted um, 200, I th forgot what, 230 dashes. That means 230 nozzles per color channel. So let's just assume that's the same number of nozzles on a Canon printhead. Well, there may be 300 nozzles, but only 230 are activated. So that leaves you with 70 on or inactive nozzles. And those nozzles are brought into play as you are printing <coughs> during time. As you are printing, and also begins to fail. Now, why would it do that? Because they use heat. Heat generates not only the pressure that you need to expel that droplet, but also creates a residue, a residual um, bit of um, crusty ink, if you will. It's like when you fry an egg and you remove the egg, there's some residue there. So that residue needs to be clean. Well, in between your multitude of prints that you're printing, it may run a cleaning cycle while it's printing, and it may be able to remove that. But if it gets to the point where the nozzles just simply, simply is shot at that point, it's not damaged physically, it's just simply clogged, it will be replaced by another nozzle that's not being used, a redundant nozzle. That happens automatically, you will not know at all. So you never really know how many active nozzles how many inactive nozzles you have in your little bank, okay? That's your little your little extra storage. So, so let's just say you have 70 and you're start, starting to use them up. And at some point, one of those channels runs out of nozzles. Now, they could either be just simply clogged or they could be damaged. If they are simply clogged but not damaged, then, yeah, the so-called refurbishing can clean them if they do it gently and don't be too abusive. And, yeah, you may have a printer, a printhead that will last you a bit. And I say a bit. It's not going to last you like a new one would. It will work, maybe. It will allow you to print. Eventually, you're going to end up in the same boat, okay? where you, your printer basically just cannot print anymore. That printhead needs to be replaced with a new one, a brand spanking new one. So it would be like a car engine. You need a new engine. You blew a piston and it's got a hole in a whatever. And you, you replace an engine with a used engine. Well, again, you have only limited life left on that new, re, that new used engine. So the same thing with these printheads. So, 
refurbishing clears them out. They can still shoot liquid through it, but are they electronically viable? Can they actually receive the signal, generate the heat, expand that little couple of microliters of ink and spit it out? Okay, you see what I mean? If the nozzles on that particular print head were damaged, sure, they clear them out, but they cannot be revived. They're damaged. And so you get a printer, a print head that has no life to it. I ordered one of these. It was refurbished. It was just, remember what this looks like? It was similar to this because it did not have the internal dampers. I said, wait a minute, what kind of printer is that? Oh, there's a bunch of components missing. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I got. Of course, I it was lost money. I ordered from China. There's no way that I'm going to you know, deal with them. So I lost about a hundred bucks on that little transaction. So be very, very weary of buying Canon printers from a refurbisher because you really don't know. And I don't know how they could possibly test them. There is a way. There is a way. There's a, res a resetting unit that I saw. In fact, Mike Lee told me about boy if you have a printhead that has simply lost nozzles due to clogging and brought in the redundant nozzles so the ones that are that got eliminated are just basically red x let's just call it red x um they're not damaged they're just now are clear uh, but they are not going to be activated because they got red x how do you reactivate those nozzles? Well, this unit, you attach the printhead to it, and it will reactivate the nozzles that were red X, and you end up with a whole set of redundant nozzles not used. But again, it's a used printhead. It's still a, a used printhead. Now, there's physical damage that could occur to those little orifices. The edges of that orifice have to be perfectly smooth and round. Pigment particles are passing through that. It's like gravel passing through that little opening. Think of it that way. And eventually it will erode it. Okay, eventually. So, yeah, just buy, buy a new printhead. If it's going to cost you as much as the printer, you know, you have to really decide uh, what is more financially uh, makes sense, in other words, um, and, and go with that choice. But, yeah. Be very wary about refurbished printheads. Uh, there's no way that I could truly um, trust one. Rick says, I am here. All right. So again, uh, let me just reiterate. Um, Rick specializes on the Pro 100, the Pro 200, the Pro 300. So everything you need to be able to refill those printers and also uh, the so-called waste ink maintenance cartridges um, for certain printers he also provides you. And everything is available on his eBay site. I have a link to that site as well as a link to Rudy Hallamum's site for ordering um, any kind of the 3D printing items that he provides. And so, again, make sure you look at the... Um, the, the uh, Links that I have provided you on a huge list. Okay, I provide you with a lot of information. Uh, Red River, um, I have a um, a uh, code that allows you to buy through that link. In other words, and they uh, uh, give us a a revenue from that. You buy from Red River. Use my link. Don't use the regular link. Use my link. Buy from Red River, and then you will then provide the channel with some revenue. The easiest way. Okay. You're still going to buy Red River. You might as well use that link. The same thing with the Amazon link. Use that Amazon link. Put it on your, save that link and use it from now on. Always, you know, order from Amazon using my link. It's the same way. It's the same. It will give you the same window that you normally would go to when you go to Amazon.com. Okay. It takes about that much more effort. Okay. 
So I would really appreciate that if you guys did that. And um, maybe this year I can buy a printer this coming year. Yeah, me neither. I, I, I really don't need something that big. I wouldn't know where to put it. I would have to get rid of some stuff. 36 inch. Holy goodness. No. Octavio Tejada says, Jose. And then he says, Feliz Navidad. It's funny that Feliz Navidad translates to happy Christmas. Feliz is happy or merry. But I think it literally means happy. Octavio Tejada says, can you tell me if the used empty color printer cartridges on a Canon Pro 300 can be refilled? If so, with what? You just refill them. You have to disable the chip. It's tricky. It's tricky. You have to disable the chip. Go to Where are you? Octavio, where do you live? If you live in the U.S., go to precisioncolors.com. www.precisioncolors.com. One word, precision colors, one word, dot com, and look at the 300. And there's a procedure there that you go through to disable the chip. Once the chip goes empty, you disable it. Now you no longer need a chip, but now you never know how much ink you really have. So you basically take the cartridge upside down like that, put it on a scale so you know how much it weighs, drip, drip, drip ink directly on that sponge, directly, drip, 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 and then you watch the weight. When it goes to about, I believe for that would be about 31.5 grams or 32 if you're lucky. Then it's full. Put the clip on it and save it. Buy Rudy Hallman's holder. Save them there until you need them. Remove this. Install it on your printer. It will read it like it's empty. It will think it's empty, but really you have ink. And then you have to, you have to set up a schedule. For you to top all of them off at the same time. So it's best to have two, two sets of cartridges. So you always have one that's full. And say every two weeks you just remove the set that was in the printer. And put the full set whose chips are also disabled. And again, you have to be very, very careful. There's no easy way to do this. You have to constantly check. So again, I would say two sets. Oh, both of them are full. Chips are, are disabled. Put one set in there. Print for a couple of weeks. Remove that set. Put the other set that's full. You know it's full. And then now fill every one of those 10 cartridges one at a time to 32 grams. Okay, but you need the ink and you need to get them from Precision Colors because that's the best ink available. Yeah, exactly. Did you guys read this? Especially when with larger uh, Canon printers. I haven't had that issue with uh, something like a Pro 100, okay, or, or a Pro 10. No, you don't have to flush it. What? Oh, wait a minute. This is cats. What? What do you? What? Why do you want to flush? Why? You think that's going to solve the problem? Not really. Not really. You're you're the fifteen hundred, the Epson fifteen hundred, right? No. No. Precision. You have to pardon my accent. I'll give you the link. If I spell it right. Okay, you're the guy from Madison? Yeah, good. So. Okay. My Epson Sugar P800 started printing photos a little crooked, smaller prints. It's not very noticeable, but larger 
the image the photo is more crooked yeah your feeder yeah your feeder um is skewing um again that's mechanical so either either the rollers are getting old and one part either the left side or the right side is is slipping a little bit and causing paper to skew as it's traveling through it oh you want to set it up for sublimation sure you got to flush yeah how you go about doing that on the fifteen thousand? is that what you want to do yeah it's a little bit you know iffy because there's no way that you can see inside those cartridges oh and i want to use the original ink cartridges for sublimation right but i mean you know there there's really no way to know and how are you going to remove the water right let me post all of your comments here okie doke all right let's see what else we got we got a couple of um things here so somebody was i i always say you know um relative relative colorimetric rendering intent and black point composition in fact q images is basically defaulted to that you mean from the exit screen yeah you could do that you can put it on a, a you know like a lot of um paper towel and just let it empty out but here's the catch once it empties out there is an internal valve that's triggered that will not allow you to refill it to full. Okay, did you know that? If the cartridge has reached empty at any one time, it will not be able to allow you to refill to full. Full is 26 grams. You will not be able to refill to full. I think Rick Johnson has the actual numbers of the amount of ink you can put in. Once you let it go empty and you try to refill, you can only put so much ink in, not, not the full original load. Okay. All right, so black point compensation makes sure that that zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, blah, 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 two hundred and fifty-five. Those first few steps are actually separated. In other words, you can see on your print the deepest, deepest black zero, 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 one, 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 two, 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 three, 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 and so on. Okay. If you do not choose black point compensation, maybe the first six or even eight will be all black. And on some images where you don't really care about shadow detail, where you don't really care about making sure that those deep shadows are separated, then yeah, just turn off black point compensation and it will then provide you with a deeper black among all of those tones that would have normally been separated. Okay? So it's up to you. Again, for your standard image printing, your control images, always use black point compensation. Then for your normal photography, just go ahead and, and make your choice, whatever you want to use, okay? It's up to you. You have full creative control over your prints. Which printer is eight years old? Did you did you post earlier? I don't remember seeing you. It was just saying that your current printer is eight years old. I'm considering the Canon Pro 1000 as a replacement upgrade. Yeah, excellent. Just make sure you're printing a lot. Epson Sure Color 8, 8, 800, yeah. Just make sure you're printing a lot. That's my printer that I also have. I also have a PA-100. It's, it's, it's lovely. I love it. And I'm running uh, refillable cartridges on it. And I'm running a, a very weird setup that no one should be running this day and age. Um, running a uh, decoder board. It's a special board that you connect to the uh, motherboard. And it has built-in chips. So forget about it. 
it's, it's a pain in the ass to use. <laughs> it really is. Now there is a chipless firmware for it that you can just turn your printer chipless and use refillable cartridges in uh, no problem. Just keep them always topped off. But yeah, uh, yeah. good luck with the Pro 1000. It's a wonderful printer. You just got to make sure you use it often. Otherwise, it's always going to run a clean cycle before you print, which wastes ink unnecessarily. All right, so let me put this away here. If you guys recall, these are a couple of the images from uh, Harold Davies. Okay, so I printed these same images. Originally, these were on the the Photo Paper Pro Premium Mat from Canon on the 8550 Custom Profile, and I realized immediately, oh, I'm using. Oh gosh, hang on. Not just any matte paper as a paper choice, which is what I use to print the charts for the profiling. Let me make sure I got this right. So 8550, let me go ahead and open up the setup for the Canon paper. Pro matte letter size. Boom. I am using, as you can see here, presentation paper mat. Okay, so that's what I used to create the charts that I then printed the uh, profiles, charts from, and then scan them. And the blacks are glorious. Just oomph, but galore. This is so much pop. I just could not even imagine that any kind of matte paper would be able to do this on a, on a dye ink printer, even if it uses a matte black ink. Okay. Fabulous. So then I found in my pile of paper the cheaper uh, relative, if you will, which is this one here. Matte photo paper is much thinner. You can hear it different tone right and uh, I profiled it it still does not come up to the quality of the pro paper eh, almost let me move this way nearly but it's a lot better than it was before simply uh, not using a profile it is a lot better and it's like much cheaper this this professional paper is only like 18 dollars for 50 sheets uh letter size from from amazon and again if you want to try it please use my amazon affiliate link go ahead and use it i will provide you guys with the profile and uh, i think it's already on the facebook group files tab just go there and access it and install it. Let's look at the sunset. The sunset on the pro paper is just majestic, just gorgeous. But it's not that bad. It's not that bad. If I if I light it very brightly and I show it to you on side by side, you might be able to see a little bit of a difference. I'm looking at the blacks. But it's really, really good. And this is cheaper even. It's just a thinner paper. So if you're going to be printing giveaways and you don't want to spend a fortune, and of course you got an 8550 that will knock these out for you without any effort whatsoever, use my profile. Uh, you should be using OEM inks. They're, they are affordable. They'll give you the very best results. And so, yeah. I'm trying to come up with excuses not to print, especially for you guys. And uh, this combination, even though it is odd, Canon paper, Epson printer, works beautifully. It really does work, okay? So please consider doing that. Just make sure you use 
the the actual um, links that I have provided you guys. Let me see if I can repost them here for you. Again, once the new year hits and the new algorithms kick in, yeah, we're not going to be making any kind of money. So let me let me post the affiliate link to Red River. This is uh, Rudy Hallamum's link. I don't know whether you can copy these links on the chat. Give it a try. If not, they're they're all inside my uh, video descriptions. And of course, Q image. You actually get a ten percent off there. And then there's Inkchip.net. And you're going to use so Inkchip.net. That is for your. Um, resetting your ink counters, and also um, transforming some Epson printers into chipless. And uh, let me see. You need to have an access code, which is for your discount. You get a discount there as well. And it's simply chipless Joe, okay? If you want to join my Patreon and support the channel that way, there's that link. And the Amazon affiliate. And if you want to join Facebook, get all those free uh, profiles and all kinds of different files, all of this, all the standard images. I have many others that you can use for specific purposes. There is the link to Facebook. All right. So enough of that. Enough marketing, if you will. Um, if you guys have, we're, we're about two hours and ten minutes into this. If you guys have anything else to talk about, just don't, don't hesitate to um, join us immediately here. Let me go ahead and load something. We can always leave after we print something cool. And we'll use that new profile that we have uh, for our um, cheaper Canon uh, regular photo matte paper. Let me see what we can pick here. <clears throat> Better look at some of the viewer photos. Hmm. This should print pretty well because it has that dreamy look to it. Now let me see if I can let me see how large this file is. See if I can get away with it's 2448 by 3264. Hmm. And I already sharpened it. Let me increase the contrast a wee bit. That's good. You don't get to see this because I'm, I'm working off of the other screen. But I'll go ahead and print it. We'll load some of that, that cheaper paper right here. And by the way, after I did the updated the firmware, ran it and also check just to make sure. It actually ran a cleaning cycle, and it is perfect. So let's open up this very flimsy packaging here. Maybe we'll do a couple. Let me do a monochrome. Ooh, how is that going to come out? It's probably going to have a color cast. I hope not. You never know. I've been doing my monochromes using black and white mode rather than printing through the uh, color manage workflow. Well, let's give it a try. Just see what happens. Let me make sure I got the printable side. Yep. 
we'll load that. Oh, and notice my tray is in. So some viewer asked, how do you do this? How do you put the tray back in? Do I have to turn it off? No, there's a little button right there that allows the uh, tray to go in. So let's go ahead and load this. I'm going to do one more image. Maybe, I don't know, maybe this one as well. And we'll print those two. That has been turned into kind of an HDR type look. Make sure that we have the correct. Okay, so that's pro. We need to change that. We need to change that. Let's remove that, those images. We're going to go ahead and change that. I have the setting already here. So click on the date because that was just done the other day. So mat, pro mat, pro mat, pro mat, pro mat. What happened to it? Here we go. Canon photo mat right on top. All right, so now we need to change the size. Oh, that's the size. So we're going to get a border. Remember I told you about getting a border. Let's do a slightly wider, wider border. I want it to look more artsy. And uh, we'll do this one. And print. Let me double check. I don't trust myself. Yeah, photo mat. Okay. And we'll print. And because it's matte, it should print relatively quick. Now, by doing this, I've actually sort of cropped it. Did I did I have it cropped? Yeah, I did. I did crop it. So it's going to have even borders all around. And for those who are wondering, how do you get an even border? I cannot get an even border. We'll check this out and see how even the borders are. got to remember that the positioning of the paper is never perfect. So you can have a lateral shift on that paper position, and it will not be centered on the so-called imaginary axis or central axis of the, the feed mechanism, in other words. So this should click 87, 95, 100. We should have this wake up. And wake up. We're running this on Wi-Fi, by the way. I guess you all were wondering. Here comes a tray. Oh, let me switch to me. As you recall, the tray was in. Now it's out. And when you're done, you just basically, there's a little button that says output tray. Click on that, and it will store it back in. I'm wondering how how good the results are going to be um, on that paper. One good thing about wearing this, get my head nice and warm. Yep. Here we go. And this is just my thing. I like to add a score around all my prints. It just makes it more fancy, if you will. I don't like just a flush border with no no separation from the background. And again, remember, this was very um, pastel-like. It was very dreamy, almost to the point where it was a little bit blurry, if you ask me. That's not bad. That's pretty close to the original. Yeah. see what the monochrome looks like. I hope it doesn't have any color gas. Let's just hope. It seems to be okay. There's a light right here that illuminates the uh, paper as it starts to emerge. One good thing about this printer is that if you notice that the paper actually rose up, so it's being supported, it's not dropping off as most printers do, which then causes the end, which is unsupported, to rise. It's like a pivot. 
There you go. Let me orient this so that it gets even lighting. Very good. That is not bad. I like the blacks. My border is 000. This is looking really good. Let me increase that light. There you go. We'll make it really bright. Look at that. So not bad, especially on this cheapo paper. It's really not the best paper in the world, but it's good enough. I'm wondering what it costs. Let me look that up real quick before I leave you all. We'll look at Amazon. It is called Canon Photo Map Paper. It's only like 0 0.21 millimeters. Oh my God. You guys are gonna probably faint. Six dollars for 45 sheets in an eight and a half by 11 pack. Oh, 50 sheets. Why does it say 45 there? Right? It says 40, 45. No, it says sheet. That's, that must be the weight. Uh, there's 50. Yeah, so $7. And if you want 13 by 19, $12. Hmm. I think you guys might want to consider that paper and then use my Amazon link, go in there and you and log on. Uh, using that, you will arrive at a, um, at a, um, what might throw you off first of all, but let me show you how you do that. And again, it's a little bit tricky. Let me, let me go to my Amazon link. Apparently, I cannot just copy and paste that one. So we're going to go ahead and log on as if I was going to use it. So there you go. I just pasted it, hit, and there's me. And wait a minute. What is that? That is 3D resin. Don't worry about it. Click on that. This is already a bunch of the stuff that I have put on it myself for customers. I have several pages of this, but don't worry about it. Just, just, just go to the top and search. Canon um, photo mat. Save that link. Use that link from now on. I beg you guys to do that because it really, really helps. And everybody orders from Amazon. And there's the paper. Five ninety nine. Same price. Yeah. So by doing that, you buy several of those boxes. I'll get, I think it's like 5%, something like that. I'm telling you guys the truth. I'm telling you exactly what's happening behind the scenes. And of course, I got to pay tax on that at the end of the year. So it's not like I, I can get away with anything. But the Pro Mat, that's the really premium stuff. This is a good, good paper. And look at the price. It's ridiculously cheap. The Pro Mat 13 by 19 50 sheets, yeah, that's that's pretty much normal. That's similar to Red River, but this combination is just unbeatable. Unbeatable on the Pro, uh, the, the EcoTank 8550. It's just unbeatable. If you use my profile, you get the very, the best results I have ever seen. I'm not kidding you. So again, that's it. I'll just leave you with that. I hope you guys enjoyed today's presentation and as always let me close this and in this particular case of course merry christmas i wish you all a wonderful christmas we'll see you new year's eve for definitely and uh don't party too much i'm gonna try not to um, but that's hard to do sometimes all right let me go ahead and set this up we're gonna replay that slideshow again so those of you who may have missed it in the beginning will get to see it again and again as always merry christmas in this case you guys be good we'll see you next week bye bye everyone whoops
wrong button. Oh, by the way, did you notice something? The camera did not turn off. Bye-bye, everyone.